Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Veg Networking Canada. We are going to begin, as we always do, with our land acknowledgement. We acknowledge, honor, and respect that many of us are located on the traditional unceded territories of many Indigenous peoples of Canada. We're here for another episode of Veg Networking Canada, where vegan plant-based companies connect and collaborate. Today, we have a spotlight and special guest. He is a former software executive, former meal kit and food truck business owner, a recipient of a cease and desist from McDonald's for their creation, the Big McKinnis. That's when they found out that they were onto something. He is a leader behind the world's first publicly traded vegan fast food company. Veg Networking Canada is pleased to introduce the co-founder and CEO of Odd Burger. Welcome, James McKinnis. Thanks so much for having me. We are happy to have you. Thank you so much for carving out some time for us today and going through these amazing set of questions that we have for you. And the first one is on a personal note. Can you tell us a little bit more in the audience who's going to be listening later on? What's your personal vegan plant-based origin story? Yeah, no, for sure. So um, I guess for me, it started um, with a health journey. Um, and I, I think that's a pretty common thing that people are like, you know, um, looking for a healthier lifestyle. So you know, I would say I really kind of start started on a plant-based diet. Uh, you know, I didn't really yet understand what veganism was all about. Um, but I was just I was just really like looking at um, you know improving some of my health conditions. So I was like diagnosed with high blood pressure like when I was like in my early thirties, and I went plant-based for like a month. I was never planning on staying plant-based. I was just like, oh, I'm just gonna do this for a little bit and see how it goes. Uh, but um, you know, I felt so much better um, after like only a month um, after kind of the withdrawal symptoms were, were, um, were gone. Uh, but, but I really kind of felt, uh, I felt amazing after, after that. Um, and I just stuck with it and I had, you know, significant um, improvements to my health. So, uh, so that's kind of how it started for me. And, you know, from there it kind of like progressed to, you know, um, uh, you know, I think more doing it for the animals and doing it for environmental reasons versus like strictly health reasons. But, um, but yeah, I mean, there are all good reasons to do it, but that's kind of where I came from. That's really great for folks to hear. Um, it could be personal for them or maybe family members that have high blood pressure and uh, just more kind of, uh, although anecdotal, but more more sort of proof that um, plants are very powerful and can actually act as medicine. So it's very, very interesting how you got your start. Um, shifting gears now from a personal to business. Your entrepreneurial origin story, we talked about it in the beginning. You had a meal kit business, a food truck business. You got the cease and desist from McDonald's. Can you tell us a little bit about your entrepreneurial story, kind of like where it sparked, where it started, and where you're at now? Yeah, like, I mean, I started in a different industry. I mean, I started in French technology. So uh, my background's in, um, like, educational backgrounds and software. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I started in that industry in the early, early 2000s, and um, I, um, yeah, I founded and ran a, a financial technology company for about seven years, um, and, um, but, but actually, you know, part of, part of me kind of getting out of that business was, you know, a focus on my health and was my plant-based journey, because part of it was that, you know, um, I sort of, uh, you know, um, I wanted to do something good for the world, you know, and no offense to anyone in French technology, but it's not like, you know, you're doing necessarily something super great for, for the planet or, you know, great for other people. It's really just um, kind of like a money-driven industry, which, um, you know, nothing wrong with it again, but it's just, um, you know, for, for, I think, someone that wants to dedicate your life to making positive change, it's not the best field to be in. So, so that's what caused me to shift into, you know, um, plant-based industry. And, you know, really it, like, um, you know, Oddburger did not start as a business, you know, and, and for me, it's, you know, if this is, um, it's a passion for me, you know, so I, like, I do this because I love it and that's why I do it and no other reason than that. But, you know, it, it really started as, as, you know, this sort of like really grassroots movement of people just coming together and like enjoying like fruits and vegetables and like, you know, it was very, um, it was very much like this, uh, you know, this, this community or movement. And then, you know, as, as, as the business kind of evolved, we, we just figured out more and more ways to, um, to sort of uh, expose people to the benefits of a plant-based diet. And that's where we kind of got the fast food. 
really, really interesting. Yeah, like wholesome beginnings, grassroots beginnings. And we've, we've heard it before, like people are maybe doing something else and then they see a gap in the marketplace. They want to do something that's more fulfilling. So that's sort of the path that you followed, entrepreneurial start. Um, really, really interesting. Being in the plant-based space, being a pioneer in the space, you know, the world's first publicly traded vegan fast food company, what are some trends that you're seeing in your industry? Well, I mean, like, like obviously, I think the trends that we're seeing, we're seeing the bigger chains starting to uh, wake up, and realizing that you know they need to offer some plant based, some plant based options. Um, so, I mean, I think we're we're seeing uh, the mainstream adoption of of plant based food, which is awesome. You know, it's actually and it's great for us too. Um, like I'm happy that big chains have plant-based options, even though like obviously we're competing against them. But the, the, the key is, is though that that I think they are really, uh, you know, they're able to expose more people to a plant-based uh, diet. And if someone has a burger at, you know, another major fast food chain, a plant-based burger, and they, they, and they like it, then I believe they're going to seek out more plant-based options and, you know, they're going to they're gonna want to try an entirely plant-based chain at some point. So like us. So I think it's, um, I think we're seeing that kind of trend and I think it's really encouraging. So, um, so yeah, I mean, hopefully, you know, again, it just creates more, more people that are plant-based customers, which is, I think, good for everybody. Absolutely. And in, in the space, we've, we've had other uh, special guests in the, in the CPG space talk about trends in terms of like packaging or, you know, environmental sustainability. Is there anything like that that you're picking up on as well too? Yeah, like we, we are actually, um, so our new line of packaging that is going to be released is going to be 100% compostable. So um, the compostable packaging thing is, uh, it's actually, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's tough to get there because especially with COVID, like in supply issues, packaging industry has been crazy. So, uh, but, but, um, but yeah, so we're, we're basically set to be, uh, like right now we're, we're plastic free, but uh, we're said to be 100% compostable uh, within about four or five months. So once all of our packaging arrives. So the 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 cool thing about that is that it'll really allow us to do, um, you know, 100% um, landfill diversion for our you know for our consumer based packaged products. Um, and part of our plan with that is to actually have compost composters in our restaurants, so that people can just put all their stuff in the compost and then it just goes right back into soil. So the idea here, I think, um, is like, we really want to be like the most sustainable um, fast food, a fast food chain uh, out there. And, and yeah, packaging is part of that for sure. And, you know, um, and we, we look at things like energy consumption with our equipment. So it's all super high, uh, high efficiency uh, equipment and, you know, and, and there's a lot of different factors I think that, that, you, that you need to look at when you're looking at sustainability and environmental stewardship. So, because um, I mean, obviously, as you guys know, just eating plant-based is the most significant thing you can do. But, you know, again, we want to be leaders and I think that's, that's kind of like an important part we do. So, you know, I think, I think that's, that's always the direction we're going into. And I think it's, um, you know, hopefully other people are going to follow. Yeah, I'm sure that I'm sure they will follow again, pioneer, pioneering uh, different, different avenues within the space. It's funny, we actually have a member of a group of vegan accountants and uh, was corresponding with him over the weekend. And he actually just got a uh, on the counter, I forget the brand, but on the counter compostable, you know, you put your compost in and it turns it right into dirt kind of thing. So it's really interesting what you hear. Oh, wow. Yeah, hearing you, what you're talking about, like kind of almost having that at the store level sounds incredible. And uh, yeah, really glad that we asked you that question because that's really, really exciting to uh, be uh, moving there in four to five months and being fully compostable and already being um, zero plastic, which is which is interesting. One more question, if I may, on the topic of trends, um, asking this because of our, our member in Spotlight that we had last week, who's a uh, vegan nutritionist. Um, and um, she was talking about trends towards um, you know, uh, moving away from diet culture and, and really nutritious food, being in the vegan fast food space, is the idea to stay fast food or is the idea as well to maybe introduce healthy fast food? Like, can you talk to that at all or does that make sense? Yeah. So, um, like, I, I guess, you know, for us, it's, it's interesting because, um, I, I think there's always a balance between health and indulgence, um, that as a restaurant, you need to be mindful of because, 
you know, if you make things too healthy, then, you know, people aren't going to want to eat them probably. <laughs> um, at least, uh, or you just, you just sort of like um, go towards a very small segment of the population. And same thing, if it's, if it's too unhealthy, then you're going to, again, kind of pigeonhole yourself with people that, you know, um, you know, don't necessarily, aren't necessarily eating consciously for their health. So we, but this is one of the reasons that we make our food. Um, and we, uh, most of our food has three or four ingredients in it, like our chicken patty, um, for example, like our, we, we don't use like um, commercial um, products like Beyond Meat or Impossible Foods or that kind of stuff. Um, and part of the reason that we don't do that is that the, uh, we try to stay away from highly processed you know, plant-based products. Um, not that there's anything wrong with it. I mean, they're, they have their place and they're great. But, um, but we, we just find that people that are uh, not vegan, you know, they come to us because we're healthier uh, fast food. And it's the reason that they come to us because, you know, I mean, they, when they fit here the word vegan, they think healthier, right? So, um, so when they come in, they really like having, you know, more natural products and simpler ingredients. Uh, and vice versa for for many vegans, we're like the an indulgence, like like we're like junk food, sort of like for them. So, uh, um, so we we always try to like really like find this balance in our food, where you know we have some menu items that are deep fried and some that are not. You know, we have some like salad wraps and we have some loaded fries or whatever. So, I think it's it's all about finding that balance in your menu and and. Um, and yeah, I mean, and, and of course, like, just, uh, we, we're also very mindful of, like, the whole allergen thing, um, because there's a lot of people out there with allergies. So, for example, like, we're not free, which um, a lot of vegan restaurants, you know, use cashews and for, like, cream sauces or other things. So, we're not free, um, and that's, you know, it's, it's, which is, again, good for people that obviously have allergies. Um, but we, we get a lot of people coming to us because they have like a dairy allergy or they have an egg allergy or a shellfish allergy or whatever it is, right? And they don't feel comfortable eating at a normal fast food restaurant because, you know, they're not very allergen friendly. So we really, um, whether it's like gluten-free or soy-free or, you know, we have an option for almost anybody that comes into the restaurant. And we're, we are always like trying to move towards like the most sort of like allergen neutral environment. Um, because it's, um, that's another sort of subset of people that, you know, that come to a restaurant for that reason alone. Well, I'm glad that we drilled down a little bit more into the menu because that's totally like a differentiator. You're not just a vegan fast food joint that's white labeling common products and then kind of pawning it off as your own and then moving into like really like honoring and respecting, um, allergens, I think is super important. I think that's a whole nother trend in and of itself. So it's really, really interesting. Um, so moving on, the next question, always kind of start by saying no right or wrong answer. Maybe you've done it and it didn't work and you're trying something new. Maybe it's in the pipeline. Maybe you do do many things that we don't know about. So the next question is, does Oddburger support any charitable organizations? Yeah, like, oh, oh for sure. Uh, and we always have actually um, since our beginning. So, um, so we work right now uh, mostly with the SAVE movement. Um, and so like in every grand opening, of our stores, we do like we donate like half the sales to the Save Movement. Uh, we do special events as well. We work also directly with like some animal sanctuaries, um, doing events where you know they sell their swag in our in our restaurant, and you know we, we donate part of the sales to those organizations as well. So um, every year we donate like thousands and thousands of dollars to vegan charities, whether it's uh, people at the Save Movement or or you know other vegan, vegan charities um but that being said you know we we don't um we don't uh work exclusively with vegan charities we also do different social justice organizations so we did like a big donation with black lives matter uh last year we did um another one with the uh lgbtq uh charity so we 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 really like our focus is like social justice and vegan sort of like organizations because we really feel like they're um they're underfunded, to be honest. Um, so, and I think too, like when you create that activity community, um, we always find that, you know, when we support them, we get supported in, in, in exchange. So it's it's a really important relationship. And especially if you go into like a new place, like you go to like a new city or wherever you are, you know, it's, that's the one great thing about the community is that you, 
like it, there is a sort of like um, support just from that community alone. So, um, so yeah, I mean, we, we always have been really, uh, you know, uh, it's always been really important for us to, to support and donate to all these causes. Well, Animal Sanctuaries, we all know that's amazing. The Save Movement, we all know that's amazing. Was not expecting sort of the, the other answer that you gave in terms of uh, uh, social, social justice and human rights, but totally makes sense, totally lines up, totally synced into everything that this movement has to offer. So very, very incredible. Thank you so much for all that, all that work that you do for, for those charities and those movements. Um, the next question is, as it relates to being a business owner, as it relates to being an entrepreneur, can we pick your brain a little bit and maybe you can give us one of each or just one is fine. Um, a book, podcast, or app that you find very valuable as an entrepreneur. Yeah, like there, they, I, I would say like um, uh, there's one book called The E-Myth. And I, and I, I don't know if you've read that before, but it's, it's interesting because it kind of talks about that to be a successful entrepreneur, you need to have like, you know, a few different, uh, a few different aspects of, of sort of, um, of, of, of the puzzle, right? There's like, you need a technician, you need a manager, you need an entrepreneur. And, and uh, so I, I um, there are definitely a few resources out there, but, you know, to be honest, um, I, haven't, uh, I haven't read a lot of books on entrepreneurship, but I haven't done, I haven't done a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, I'm just, I guess I'm just too busy creating or doing my own stuff. So it's, it's, it's one of those things where, um, where I think when you're like living entrepreneur, when you're living that lifestyle and you've done it for so long, it's very hard to, to sort of stop doing it and to, you know, just read a book about it or whatever because you're too busy creating or whatever. So, yeah. Totally valid. And we've actually had folks uh, give that same answer. Like, I'm too thick in it to, to pay attention to what other people are doing. Like, I'm busy creating and doing exactly what you said. And um, that one that you did go, did the one that you did give, though, the e -myth, um, for those who don't know, fabulous book about, trying to focus on what you're great at and bringing in people who may not be uh, or who may be great at what you're not great at and building that that team, which I'm sure is going to be part of the advice that you give a little, a little later on and part of the big reason of your success, uh, James. Um, so next question, what and who inspires you from a company level? Maybe it's a local company, like, you know, obviously the charities that you work with inspire you. Maybe it's a global company that has nothing to do with the fast food industry, but that is the next question is, what is some companies or a company that inspires you in your business? Oh, we just got you on mute. Oh, sorry about it. Um, I'm, always, I'm, always, um, I'm always inspired by, uh, you know, technology companies. I, I, think, I think for me, just, Having a tech background, um, it's so um, uh, it, it's so important to sort of like understand where the technology in general is going in the world, right? So, for example, like EV technology or you know metaverse technology, all that kind of stuff. Because for me, like what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to you know take my technology background and put it into the the, the plant based food industry. Um, whether that's with restaurant technology or manufacturing technology or, you know, technology for how to grow food or whatever. Um, so I, I would say like I have a, I have a deep interest in uh, on the tech side of things because I think the the answer is, um, you, know, you know, the answer like how are we going to win, you know, this war on people destroying the planet? The answer always is the technology solution because the it's it's sort of like the only way that you can really get uh, a competitive advantage right so you can't really like get a, get that kind of competitive advantage unless you have the technology right and so this is this is why like, i'm so excited to you know be developing such cool technology at Alberta. and um, there's so much more that we're going to be doing um, because you know again like how do you compete against the huge chain like mcdonald's and same thing like how does netflix compete against blockbuster how does how does how did any of these companies compete the answer is always comes back to technology because it's not enough just to you know say hey we're going to create you know good food um it just is it just actually it actually is not enough um because you have to now think we need to create good food but it has to be at a price point that is competitive and that's the, that's the tricky part and how do you how do you apply the economics uh, to it. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, you know, the companies that uh, I'd say like, you know, I, I love to follow are like Tesla and like, you know, even like the big companies like Apple and, you know, Facebook and that kind of stuff. Um, anything tech related I think is, is so cool and, and is, is much needed in the plant-based space. 
absolutely much needed. And given your background and your clear passion for that type of an answer, I'm sure we could spend a whole hour just talking about food tech, uh, future of food and how that integrates. So that's very, very interesting. Thanks so much for sharing uh, some companies that inspire you and more so like a sector that inspires you and uh, can further the movement. Um, so usually this is our last question, um, but we have some so four bonus questions for you after this one. Um, so with that being said, what is some advice that you have for business owners and entrepreneurs? And you can pick one or kind of give a, a broad answer, but coming maybe from the perspective of somebody who might be looking at becoming an entrepreneur, maybe somebody who just started, maybe somebody in the middle of their journey, or maybe somebody looking at an exit or going public or something like that. Do you have any advice for business owners and entrepreneurs, Jane? Well, I mean, I, I think I think the thing is, is like I think when 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 when, I, when anyone is considering uh, becoming an entrepreneur, so I mean, I guess I'll start with that. When you're becoming an entrepreneur, I think I think the the one thing that maybe people uh, don't really understand is like there is a sacrifice to being an entrepreneur. It's like it's not an easy path, right? Like, um, it's it's like it's you know it's a long journey it's you know underpaid for many years uh it is financial insecurity it is like sleepless nights it's all that kind of stuff so um but but you know the reward obviously is that you're doing hopefully something that you love and you're passionate about so it it justifies the that sort of like um that hardship but you know you really have to be i think in the right place in your life and around the right people as well you know because uh um, if you're with a partner that doesn't support it or, you know, you have like huge financial commitments, it's hard to quit your job and just be like, okay, I'm just going to go do this startup and, you know, not, not bring a paycheck in for a couple of years. Like, you know, so it's, I think you have to be in that sort of like that right environment. And so I always, I always kind of tell people is like, you know, make sure, make sure like you're surrounding yourself with people that are going to support that journey because it's, it's not enough to just, um, you know, just say, I'm going to do what I love, you know, um, whatever. Um, although that's the reason that you're an entrepreneur, it's not, you, you really need that support system in place. Um, it's really hard without it. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think if you look like later down the path, you know, I think um, if you do have that, you get started, you know, now the next question is like, and this is actually the, the hardest part is like, how do you grow? I think I, I always tell people that is the hardest part is, is growth because there's always a balance between how much capital you have, how much capital you want to raise, and how much you're spending and balancing that out, and how much equity you're giving away, you know, in your business along that path, right? So, I mean, I see, I see that a lot of entrepreneurs like raise a lot of money early on, and you know, give a lot of equity away, which um, which hurts you later, right? It's not something you think of. Uh, it's like, oh, I, I wish, you know, I wish I'd raised less three years ago. I would have owned, you know, 40% of the company instead of five or whatever it is, right? So I think I think entrepreneurs have to be careful about, you know, doubting themselves too much because if you're working at your startup and you own 5% of it, then you're kind of just, you just have a job again. It's almost like you haven't really necessarily like built yourself um, any equity. So it's always a balance there. And, and I've always, we've always been like really conservative on the amount of money that we've raised we've always been really raising the least that we can just trying to sort of like get by and run a really lean efficient business um and and i think that's a good thing like i think it's not a bad thing to be like sort of like on the edge of, of your 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 financing needs because it also helps you to be more efficient right if you're like um and if it's almost like if you have too much money, then you just don't care or something. It's like, but if you if you need to watch every dollar and you need to like, you know, um, you know, make sure that your labor is this percentage because if it's not, you're not gonna make money. You, you really are more focused on like how well the business is running, which helps you tremendously later on. Like if you build a good model, a good business early, then you're gonna be profitable much earlier and you're gonna figure out those things earlier and you're gonna have to raise less money later on. So so I think that's you know, that's a little bit about that. And then I guess lastly, like, um, you know, on the whole um, public thing, I mean, I guess we can talk about that in the bonus questions probably, but yeah, uh, going public is a whole other like ball of wax to speak. So it's- <laughs> Absolutely. I, the, conversation. Yeah, incredible answer in terms of advice. Like again, uh, obviously do what you love, have a passion for it, but make sure that there's people around you who are gonna 
fill in gaps that we might not have. So it doesn't just turn into a, a hobby or a charity, but it actually turns into a business. Um, amazing. So let's 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 dive into let's dive into that uh, uh, question about going public uh, right now. When should a company go public and why? Well, um, you know, I, I guess I guess the sort of the, there is no really right answer. I think I think it's really um, you know we went public um, for a few reasons. Um, one one of the reasons was that it was sort of like an extraordinary moment in the market for plant based companies. Like it was like there was like quite a few plant based public companies going public, and the valuations were were good. Um, which I still think, to be honest, that I still think that they're they're fair. I think that if you look at where the world's going to go, I think that um, I think that the whole plant based sector has a lot of growth, you know, ahead of it. But um, so uh, so that's one thing. But but you know, really, I think the 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 key is um, you want to go public when you are really looking at you're just sort of on the verge of like going profitable, and you're on the verge of like explosive revenue growth um, because uh, you know in, in the markets you, you have a, you have a whole new sort of like level of um, expectations right like where your financials are public and people are looking at you know how your performance was in last quarter and like in your private company like no one really cares that much because you know maybe your investors care a little bit but uh, there's a lot more like understanding about like okay like you know Whatever we had a bad quarter, we need to we'll fix it next quarter. In the public markets, like you know, the expectations that every quarter you be growing, every quarter you need to, like have record sales, every quarter it's going to be like blockbuster growth and like you know. And so, I think you want to kind of make sure that you're in that stage and you're not in like sort of like an R and D stage or like in a stage that's too early. So for us, we really were in that stage where, you know, we had really spent years like developing the model and don't love the food and we felt like we really had something that we could now just grow so um so yeah and i mean for us it's been you know really successful like we've opened five new locations since we're in public we sold three additional franchises like we have um we have uh you know 10 more locations in development so for us there's like we are in that sort of like high growth phase um but you know, again, for the market, it can't have the growth can can never happen quick enough, or it can never happen soon enough. So, so it's. Uh, but you know, for me, I love it. I don't mind it because you know we. I feel like uh, like we operate well under pressure, and we're like we're, we have that kind of culture where the pressure sort of drives us forward and lets us, you know, expand more quickly, which is a good thing. I mean, we need to expand quickly to help the world and have people eat more sustainably and better and all that kind of stuff. So. Um, so yeah, for us it's it's great, but but again, you know, it's it's definitely not for everybody. And I would say you just have to make sure that you look at all these factors before you go public. Absolutely, everything you said totally. And what, in to your latter point there, again, that's where those good people, having those good people around you, are going to come in and help give you some insights and uh, figure out if if and when is the right time and and have that uh, that plan. Really interesting to hear. It sounds like the culture of Oddburger has a uh, a culture of almost like athletics, sort of that competition, that drive, uh, that that firing well under pressure. I absolutely love that in culture and businesses. I think that that's very, very uh, valuable. So that's, that's incredible to hear. You touched on franchises. You touched on your growth. That's the next question that we have for you, which is what's involved in buying a franchise and what type of entrepreneur does well in a franchise environment? So um, yeah, I mean, so the, the the steps involved in buying a franchise are, you know, step one obviously is like kind of like the interview process. So uh, the application the interview. So uh, people go to people who can go to our website. We have like a bunch of information about like the franchising and you know what it is and how it works and that kind of stuff. I think he's like how much money do you need and all that kind of stuff. So basically, uh, people would just go to our website, you know, agora.com fill out the franchising application. And then from there, we, we sort of like, um, you know, we look at a number of factors. We look at, we look at you know, their background and, you know, the their, their reasons for doing it. Uh, and obviously, like, if they're financially, like, able to, to open a franchise, because it is, like, a sizable financial commitment. Um, and then we kind of, like, we have an interview um, 
you know, different several stages of interviews with different people in the company. Um, I, I always interview all the franchisees that come into our system personally because, again, I just you know want to make sure that these are people that we want to work with and people that understand our mission and we're here for the right reasons. So, so the the, the and I think the type of people that do well uh, as franchisees are the people that have the passion for it. So you know we're always looking for people that are doing uh, this for the right reason. And you know for the, and we we do get a lot of people that are vegan or plant based that um, or vegetarian that um, that want to have a business that matches their their ethics because there's not a lot of businesses out there that you can do that match what you believe in, right? Like, like, okay, I'm a financial advisor, but you know, I'm vegan. That's what I'm really passionate about or whatever. So it's, it's, it it is really hard to match what your passion is with your day-to-day job. And I think the big, the the big sort of like um, uh, interest for people getting a franchise with us is that it gives them opportunity to live that sort of life. It's like, wow, I can have a vegan business and, I can open like one odd burger or five odd burgers and, you know, be a part of this like world changing company and like contribute my efforts to it and, you know, give my feedback and how do we make the processes better or what are cool products that we can maybe launch. Um, because, you know, again, for us, we always look at franchisees that kind of like bring something to the organization as well, because um, so we, we get a lot of people that have like real estate background or construction background or a background in technology or a background in different areas. So, um, which is great for us because it enriches us, right? So um, um, we're always like really receptive to like feedback and ideas. Or sometimes it'd be like, hey, is it awesome menu anyway? item? You can do this, this, this. It's amazing. So these are things that we can sort of like implement. So, but yeah, and then basically, um, you know, after that, uh, we, you know, there's, there's obviously like, you know, legal paperwork, a huge document that, that is um, very long to read, but, uh, you know, for people that have the time and interest, they can read it or their lawyer can. But, but yeah, I mean, we always recommend people like throw your read documents and all that kind of stuff. And then, and then, you know, you pay the franchise fee. And then we basically have then sort of like worked with franchisees to help find a location. So location is like so important in franchising. It's so important in, in really, especially the restaurant business, because um, you know if you're on this corner or that corner, like it's like the, or this plaza versus that plaza, it's it's a difference of like you know, hey, uh, twice as much traffic go to your restaurant or not, right? So, so and that's where really like we we find that um, the franchisees have typically that local knowledge that we don't have, right? So, and this is something where we're if we're franchising in. You know Texas or something like you know some place that I've never been. Um, you know it's I don't know what is a good spot, right? So this is where like the franchisees bring that local knowledge, and it's so important to the organization that they know that this is a good spot because they've lived there for twenty years and they know that this plaza is dead. No one goes there. You know don't, don't open there. Um, so it, it's 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 like so that location search is a big part of it, and then really you know after that. Once we find a location, then it's very kind of systematic. Like we have all the designs and all the you know prototypes for building the spot out, and then you know we just really just get it built and then open. So it's um, you know, and then there's obviously a big training program and all that kind of stuff. Um, franchisees get trained right from you know how to how to maintain the equipment to how to make every menu item to how do you mop the floors. Um, you know, it's we we always want franchisees to know everything um, because ultimately it's their business, right? So uh, they're the ones that are going to care about it the most. So we really we really sort of um, focus a lot on, on the training because that's that's you know that's how we have the consistency across the company. Yeah, exactly, and that's the benefit. Those those are the people who are going to do really well. Is somebody who wants to have a turnkey business, not necessarily build something right from the ground up, right? Those are the people who you're right. Like I have these values, this company's turnkey. I have the capital. I'd like to deploy it here. This makes sense. So that's, that's incredible. Um, is there anything that you want to mention for your franchising in particular that might be like coming up and exciting or can you maybe mention that or not yet? I don't know. Well, I mean, I I think generally speaking, like if, if you sort of look at, you know, our franchising strategy, um, it's really uh, broad. So we geographically, you know, so we're opening spots in Victoria, 
you know, Calgary, Ottawa, obviously we have our base here in Southwestern Ontario, but we're soon going to be, you know, entering the U.S. market. So I think that the, the key here is like the, um, uh, some, like, if you have a lot, of, a lot of brands that, you know, maybe they'll, they'll franchise, you know, just in Toronto market or something like that, and then they become like, you know, a Toronto franchise brand. Um, and it's something that we really don't want to be. We don't want to be like a Canadian, just a Canadian fast food chain. We want to be like a global chain, right? So, so we're, so we're really focused on, you know, um, right now, I think, testing that geographic reach. And because what's so exciting about that is if the model works in Toronto, it works in Vancouver and it works in Halifax and it works in LA and New York and whatever. And if the model works in all, in all those places, um, the exciting thing about that is that, is that it, it provides a proof of concept that it can work anywhere. And the more cities that you have this, this sort of this model working, the bigger your scope of where you can go. So I think once, once, um, and, 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 you know, right now we're in six different cities and, you know, we're, we're successful in those cities. So, so now the question is, is like, where else can we go? You know, um, is this going to work everywhere? And if it works everywhere, then, you know, the opportunity for growth is tremendous. And I think that's what franchises kind of see as I see, and that's where the exciting excitement is because, um, you know, if you open, say, a, you know, a site in, you know, New York City, for example, um, and it does well, well, you know, maybe open 20 more. And, and that is really the key to franchising. The key to franchising is multi-unit, having like lots of, uh, lots of, um, lots of restaurants. Um, and that's how you really, you know, I think do really well in franchising. The people that are sort of like really into franchising know that. And that's why if you look at the really successful franchisees, most of them have like multi-units. So we really want to support people like that because again, you want to make people successful and have a great business and, you know, support their passions while they're doing it and make the world a better place. And, you know, for us, there's nothing better than that. So, and same with franchisees for them, that's, that's, that's what they want too. So, so that's, that's really what we set up. We set up this model that, that allows people to, to run this, you know, big business. We want, we want franchisees to, to run big businesses. So that's kind of our goal, right? To infinity and beyond. That's so right. Totally. How, how cheesy is that? Um, <laughs> uh, okay. Last, is there anything when it comes to your franchises in Canada from a financing perspective that there might be news to mention or no, not yet? Yeah. So actually the, the, the one cool thing about the, uh, the franchises, uh, the franchising in Canada is that we do have like amazing financing programs through, um, through CABC and through uh, BMO um, and RBC. So um, we, we offer like up to 90% financing on the equipment and leasehold improvements up to $350,000. So, um, and these are, they're also government backed loans, which is pretty cool. So there's um, less, less personal risk for franchisees um, on, the, on the loan amount if God forbid something did work out. But, uh, but basically the, the exciting thing about it is that it really gives more people access to, uh, to, to, you know, to franchising because you, you just don't need much capital you can spread that loan out over like 10 years. So, um, so I think it's, it's, um, and Canada has, these, have, they have, we have these great programs that are back with government and administered through the big banks. And, um, yeah. And I mean, the banks, um, you know, they, they love our business model and they believe it. And that's why they're, they're willing to offer such a, such a aggressive financing rate for prospective franchisees. So for us, you know, again, if you can, if you can franchise, you know, um, you know, up to 90% of the, of the restaurant, then it just means you can open more restaurants with your cash, right? You can, you can get, you can, you, your cash goes further to open up more units. And that's really what we want is we want, you know, to, to encourage that. So yeah, so we're excited about that. I think it's, it's a great business opportunity for people that are, that are sort of like in that position. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's, uh, that's incredible news. Uh, two final questions for you. We're going to start with, why did you and your team spend years building a brand and then decide to change it? Yeah, so so we that that was uh, that was a crazy period of time, but yeah, so we like our company started out with a different name, 
So we were, we, and we went public with their name. It was called Globally Local at the time. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting because when you, when you start a company, you don't necessarily know where you're going to go, where you're going to end up. So when we started the company, we were doing like organic produce and like, it was like a produce company, which kind of makes sense for a name like Global Global. Um, but then we kind of evolved into fast food and then the whole like lawsuit with McDonald's um, because we were, we were going to be, we were, we were actually going to change our name to like vegans. Uh, but then McDonald's like stopped us from doing it. Uh, because they they ended up using that name, I think, in Europe or something for one something that they're doing. So they like they didn't like that. Um, even though my last name is McKinnis, um, it didn't really matter. <laughs> so um, so we but um, but to be honest, like we we um, so so when we went public, uh, we were we'd already started the process of rebranding probably like six months before that, it was a long process of like, how do you find a name? It's so hard to rebrand, what do you mean that? And that kind of stuff. And, and so, um, and the hardest thing is, is actually the trademark. So the, the, the you know, the, the, re, the kind of catalyst behind this was that we were not able to get the trademarks for globally local in the US or in Canada. Uh, so there was like objections from someone else in Canada and, and someone else actually had the mark in the States for food use. So, so basically, we're kind of faced with a challenge where it's like, you can't keep investing in something that potentially has that kind of like risk. So we have to change it to something. So, so, so basically, you know, we worked with some incredible branding companies, um, you know, two, number two, two different branding companies, actually, um, out of Toronto. And, you know, again, long process of like, you know, what names and what do people think about it? And and you know, we ended up selling on Oddburger. And it was interesting because when I first heard the name Oddburger, I was like, oh, I don't like it. It's kind of like it's like offensive to vegans or something. And I think like, like, why are we calling vegans like odd or weird? And, and then, but then the more I thought about it, it's actually, it's not actually about, it's not actually for vegans, you know, really. It's for people that aren't vegan. And if you're not vegan, then you have a very you have a like when we asked like a hundred non-vegans what they thought of Oddburger, like, oh, we love it. It makes sense. You guys are vegan, you're doing things differently than other people. It's like, okay, like, yeah, it's kind of it's odd, yeah, because to them it is odd. You know what I mean? So, so we really had to, we really had to get out of our bubble, out of our like vegan bubble, and you know, and because vegans, we we know that we're not weird. We're doing like they're everyone else is weird. So it's this whole funny like thing where it's like who's weird, who's odd? Like they think we're odd, we think they're odd, like all that stuff. But so we love the humor around it because I think I think humor is something that actually connects people of where, where you have differences right like if you're like this and I'm like this and we have these stark differences and we can laugh about something then it actually brings us together right away so so we so we ended up we ended up um you know taking the plunge and doing the name change uh which was like super like I mean we're still changing things like a year later or whatever um almost a year later so um but yeah I mean everything from the packaging to your signage and you know luckily for us when we changed it we were just about to open you know five new locations so we really wanted to make sure that we weren't like opening them under a different brand and then having to spend all this money rebranding so the timing was like when we had to do it like just after we went public right before we're going to open all these spots and we, we just we, so it was like a narrow window where we just had to do it then and that, that is actually, you know, I think when you're an entrepreneur, it's all about timing that way. Like timing is everything. If you, if you do the thing at the right time, then, you know, you get a good result. And if you don't, then it's not as good. So, so we really kind of like, um, I think, did it at the right time. And, and um, you know, initially, just like anything, like, it did, I don't think it mattered what, what, I don't think it would have mattered what we would have called it. Like people love and hate the name. Like it, doesn't, it wouldn't matter what we changed to. Because people are like, oh, I love your old name. And some people are like, oh, like, I love the new name and I hate the new name and all that kind of stuff. So, but um, I mean, I knew it was one more thing. People just take used to it and then you just don't think twice about it and just, I don't know, it's upper and it's great. So, <laughs> no, yeah, it is great. And that's such a, I know that like, you know, just listening to when that was happening, different investors and people questioning it, like why and listening to your point, like I like it, I don't like it, whatever, whatever. But really interesting response from you as to like why you did it. And again, if we just literally talked about a brand redesign and the pillars and the vision and everything, that could be like a whole other hour conversation. So thank you for uh, just being open and honest about the reason why and everything. I think that's incredible. Um, yeah, yeah. And the, and the funny thing about, you know, 
the, the other funny thing about Auburger is that, and I don't know if you notice this as well, or any of our customers could be interesting, but every time I see the word odd, doesn't matter where it is, I think of our, I think of us. Like if I if I see someone else using the word odd, I'm like, oh, oh, like Auburger. So it, the cool thing actually about it is, is that you, you end up kind of like owning a word or something that is just everywhere. And people associate odd with vegan and with odd with us, right? And, but, but it kind of like, it, it kind of like gets into your head or it kind of, it gets into culture because all of a sudden it's like, um, I, I, noticed, I noticed like the other day that McDonald's, they, there was some article that said, McDonald's is release, re-releasing an odd burger. That was like the title of the article. I was like, oh, I, I got it. I'm gonna open this up. And it was like, they're releasing something like, it was something in Japan, they're releasing a burger that was like something. But right away it made me think of like, oh, like they're using our word or they see like our name or something. And so it, it's, it was very interesting like kind of reaction. And I think that's, I mean, I think that's part of like, these are some of like the deeper things that are, are like the power of branding. Cause branding is so powerful, right? Branding is everything. That's why we, we just work with like, just really, really incredible branding companies. Cause if you work with right people that are really good at it, the, you know, um, you create that foundation for the business and brand, if you build a business on a brand that is not solid and not, not great, then it hurts you later on. And it makes it harder for people to remember your name and who are they. And like, um, in fact, people just used to call us like, oh, that vegan chain, because they could never remember our names. So, oh, it's like the vegan fast food chain that just called us the vegan fast food chain. Whereas now people just call us off or they don't even refer to that, so. Absolutely, so, absolutely. Yeah, so it's, it's cool to see the change. And when you tell the story about like McDonald's in the article, my, my brain goes, all right, McDonald's, here's your cease and desist now. You yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Payback time. <laughs> um, you, I wasn't going to ask the first time because I don't like making people, putting people on the spot and making them feel like they have to pick favorites, but it sounds like you work with two companies that you may want to just drop their name here. Uh, yeah, so the, the actual name Odd Burger was created by uh, a company called Sidley. Uh, so Cindy is a like a, they're a Toronto branding company. They, they um, I guess they're most well known for like the We the North campaign, with the Raptors. They like invented that campaign, the Raptors. So like, you know, but they've done a bunch of other great work too. Um, so they were kind of like part of that initial like naming discovery process. Then we ended up developing the brand under uh, a different company called Concrete and another Toronto branding company. And they're really more focused, I think, on like the packaging and food space. Um, so they've done like a lot of great projects with, you know, companies like Mac and, and awesome. uh, yeah, and that kind of stuff. So they were they were fantastic to like really I think implement the brand. So we we ended up kind of working with these two companies. And I think the end result was was pretty awesome. So on Concrete, for example, they they developed our own um, font. So like the Auburger font, it's like it's a it's a totally like custom it's, font. It's unique us. It's like it just it's just, it's all just one big art project, right? So it's totally like unique and um and which is so cool and then we developed like all of our own characters um we hired uh, illustrators one from uh Jiro Bibas from um from UK another one from the states so they, they created our odd emojis we call them and our tricky character our mascot so so again like a lot of like a lot of work with like you know artists and branding companies and that kind of stuff and you know I mean this is at the heart of, I think, any good brand is like the creative process. I mean, this is why for us, like the cre creative people and, and artists are like, for us, the most valuable types of people that we work with, so. Yeah, that's the super fun and sexy part. I love it, I love it. Um, like many people in the planetary speaking space, of course, not everybody, but like most of us, to your point, the community is really focused about lifting, lifting each other up and kind of sharing ideas and collaborating with the whole reason for Veg Network in Canada. And so, the last question for you is, of course, it goes without saying, I know you don't want this for anybody. You don't want any other restaurant to go under anything like that. So just start off by saying that. But with that being said, how did Odd Burger thrive while other restaurants were folding during the last couple of years? We're going to end with that. And it's a nice positive note, nice uplifting note. Yeah, like it, it was actually kind of, it was almost, I think it was almost by accident that we ended up really being in a position that thrived, allowed us to thrive. Um, and I guess this is just part of an entrepreneur story again, you know, um, and, but, but the, the, the foundations of that were that we had a restaurant in London, Ontario, and 
the street ended up getting closed for like a year for construction. They ripped up the whole street. You couldn't drive down the street. Totally inaccessible. It was the first, it was actually the, our first location that we opened up. It was on uh, in, in downtown London. And um, and it was just brutal, obviously. Like, you know, we go from people, all these people walking around, coming in for lunch to no one coming anymore because people don't want to walk down the street that's unconstructed, basically, or drive down, et cetera. So we were kind of in a position where it's like, okay, how, what are we gonna do? Like, how do you make it through like that kind of challenge? So we ended up developing, so we, we knew we we knew that the only way for us to make it through it was we had to be able to operate the restaurant with one person. Like we couldn't have more than one, just from a labor cost point of view, like we couldn't have more than one person working there. So the question was like, how were we gonna do that? So we ended up putting in self-checkout, we went cashless, we totally transformed the cooking equipment, like got rid of the grill, like we, we, we changed how we made the food. Um, so that really like you could, so, and you automated all the equipment. So it was like all just like push button. And we launched this concept called the Spark Kitchen, which is like an automated kitchen. The idea is that you can run a restaurant with as little as one person and everything is just pre-programmed. So you just like push a button here, push one there and, you know, take the food out and then just put it together. So, so we, we and the model worked. It, it allowed us to operate business, survive. You know, we, we made it through it. We, we were just having a break even for a year, basically, um, and just keeping the restaurant, paying our rent, and keeping the lights on, right? So, um, and then basically the pandemic hit. So we went and then, so we opened Toronto uh, using the same model. And the pandemic, when the pandemic hit, we'd already had developed this like super efficient, compact store model, which runs in like less than a thousand square feet. And, you know, there's no interaction, there's no like cash being changed, which reduces like transmission disease and like all that kind of stuff. Self -check. We already had self checkout. We, we, so we were already totally like positioned um, for the pandemic world, which is like takeout. Uh, we were already like just specialized in takeout. Um, so, so then, so the, obviously when the pandemic hit, we were just in a position that people had already, were already coming to us for takeout. And obviously as everyone knows, people got lots of takeout during the pandemic. So for us, it was, we were, we did really well. We were busy during the pandemic. We did, we were, I was, we were trying to open as many restaurants as we could during the pandemic. And landlords were like, hey, come this way. Like <laughs> No one else wants to rent any space. So, so it, it was, it actually kind of opened up an interesting opportunity. We, we were like aggressively standing, looking for sites, looking for restaurant sites, building a restaurant business, whereas other restaurants were like, just trying to survive closing or putting the brakes on expansion because most restaurants were, you know, had dining in, dine in heavy businesses, right? So, um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of like how we made it through it. And I think it was, it was one of those like really wild experiences that just goes to show you like sometimes, um, the, the challenges that you face as an entrepreneur like can sometimes benefit you later on un unexpectedly where you don't know how it's going to benefit you. <laughs> totally, totally. Like, you, totally, totally. That's like the epitome of the entrepreneurial spirit. Like you, you're so modest. You started out by saying like, oh, it was an accident and this kind of, but it's like, no, like we were hit with this massive challenge. We took our entrepreneurial spirit, we pivoted, we did something completely new. And that's what set us up for success when, you know, the next obstacle came. So super, super, super inspiring story. I don't know how many people know that. That's incredible. Um, must, like I said earlier, you just must have such an amazing culture among the franchisees and, and all the uh, employees that work um, within Odd. So amazing conversation, James. Thanks so much for taking an hour. Uh, before we let people know where they can find you on the web and on Instagram and the stock ticker, is there anything that you want to mention that maybe we forgot to bring up? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess the last thing is, is, you know, the, um, like, obviously, like, like, as a public company, the, um, the, 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 the cool part about being a plant-based public company, the really interesting thing about, about that is that, and, and this is the reason that I think, um, you know, again, that we, uh, um, the benefits of, of being public is that anyone can support you from anywhere. You know, you don't have to like necessarily like, go to a restaurant, you eat at a restaurant to support us. You can go out and buy our stock from anywhere in the world and support a vegan company. And I always thought that was like a really cool thing, whereas that you can get this idea of like, you know, um, I, I want to invest in a business that I believe in, that I think is going to, you know, change the world. And 
making it easier for people to support support a, a plant-based business that way. So it's it's really cool again to to have that sort of like um, ability to do that, you know, as a public company, and and that's that's you know one of the big reasons that we did it, just to to give the average everyday person access to being able to invest and support in companies that they believe in. Because in my opinion, there's not enough plant-based companies out there. There's not enough vegan companies. There's not enough green companies or uh, technology focused companies that are, you know, doing positive things for the planet. We need a lot more of that stuff. And I think that we're going to see this big green economy coming where people that aren't on the right side are just going to get crushed when, you know, when we start seeing the big effects of climate change and, and that kind of stuff. And there's, there's going to be very little room for companies that are still exploiting and using the world, I think in the future. And I think companies that aren't yet green or that base the company on, you know, destroying the world or aren't going to be around long. So again, I hope that more people sort of like consider it, more companies, you know, join the sustainability like movement. And I think this is going to be a big, big, big future for, for anyone that's in the space. Big, big future. And we gleaned so much from you uh, during this conversation. James, thanks so much. And uh, you heard it here, folks. If you're looking for support at scale, um, you know, going public might be might be an option. And um, it's the whole concept of voting with your dollar, like you said. It's just so, 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 so powerful. All right, folks. So the Toronto um, Stock Exchange Venture, ODD, ODD, the Canadian Venture Exchange, ODD, ODD. Talk to your broker through maybe your mobile app that you have that you do direct investing. Just type in odd, odd burger. You're going to find it. You can invest anytime. This is not financial advice. This is just information and educational purposes. And lastly, we're going to tell you where you can uh, find out more information about franchising, which is an exciting opportunity, especially in Canada with the financing arrangements that they have. You can find out more on the web, www.oddburger.com, just how it sounds. And you can drool away on Instagram and also laugh a little bit with their humor that they have in their culture. And that's on Instagram at Odd Burger Fast Food. James, thank you so much for joining us on Veg Networking Canada. We wish you all the best in the new year. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me on. It's been fun.